even a country that's relatively sophisticated like Russia was not prepared for the scale of attack that we could mount against them. It's easier than a regular ransomware that you need to penetrate the organization and then encrypt the files, right? Keep the key and in DDoS right. you don't. You don't need it. Exactly. This really should be a lesson to the world that DDoSing a country is really a, a real thing. You can DDoS an entire country. But the beauty of this tool is that it allows us to create packets of just about any type and size. Okay, using this IP address as the source IP address, and this one as the destination IP address. Okay. Let's go ahead and run that and see how it does. So it's gone ahead and it's flooding the other system with a, a massive amount of fragmented UDP packets. Hey everyone, okay. Yaniv Hoffman here, back with another video and back with the channel uh, favorite, Occupy the Web. Welcome. Thanks, Yaniv. It's always good to be on your channel. Definitely, and I appreciate it. And it's been a long time, so I hope you are uh, doing great. Thank you. So far, uh, things are going really well. We uh, continue to expand at Hackers Arise, and that's keeping me very busy. But... Uh... Thank you. So today's topic is uh, actually close to my heart, and it's about uh, a DDoS, Distributed Denial of uh, a Service. We'll speak about what is DDoS. It's an odd topic today, mainly influenced by geopolitical uh, tension, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, uh, Hamas, but not only. Many proxy groups that are pro different sides are, are active and very active uh, actually and maybe if we'll have time we'll speak more about even the risks and iot and maybe have a, a short brief uh, end zone demo with the hping uh, tree so a lot of stuff uh, today with that said if you are not familiar with the occupy uh, the web is the author of some exceptional uh, books the first one linux linux basic for hackers and i just learned that this is the best-selling Linux uh, books in uh, Amazon, definitely an exceptional uh, book. I recommend everyone uh, to have it. The next one is Getting Started, Becoming a, a, a Master Hacker that got two, two main uh, awards. One, it was chosen to be one of the top five cybersecurity books of all time. And another organization also chose it as the, the best malware uh, uh, book out there. So definitely, if you want to become a master hacker, that's the, the best way to start with. And the latest uh, book, which is important, this is the Network uh, Basic uh, for uh, Hackers. And as I always say, networking is the foundation for uh, everything we do. So it's part of the golden triangle of the operating system, networking and security on your path to become a, a master uh, hacker. Oh, well, thanks for that honor. I uh, I guess the reason that I wanted to talk about DDoS today is that I think it's really being overlooked as a major cybersecurity threat. I mean, a lot of people kind of think of DDoS as the script kiddies in the basement, uh, all shooting packets at a website, and it's something from the past versus something that is happening right now, every day, right? We're seeing major DDoS attacks against, in some cases, against companies, in some cases, against entire countries, right? And as they are getting worse, you know, it becomes more and more important that cybersecurity professionals, one, be prepared, okay, and know how to handle it. and probably have in place on their edge protection against DDoS attacks. So I wanted to just kind of raise that issue. And I raise it now because it has become more and more a tool uh, of geopolitics, mm -hmm. right? We're seeing DDoS attacks being used in cyber warfare in the present time, right? That coupled with the fact that there are millions of compromised IoT devices, and hopefully you're familiar with that term, that's Internet of Things. 
And that's all the stuff, you know, all the security devices, the refrigerators, the baby monitors, you know, all of that stuff that's connected to the internet that all has little tiny Linux kernels in them. So almost all those devices have a little Linux kernel and they're very, very small. You know, we're used to using a very robust, strong Linux for doing, you know, hacking or administration of a network. But these devices have these little tiny Linuxes that have just what they need to run, say, be a baby monitor or a security camera. But most of them, a lot of them, okay, are connected to the internet. That's why, that's why you can see your security monitor, right? It's because it's connected to the internet. And many of these devices, millions of them, have been put up on the web with little or no thought of security. And millions of them have been compromised. You know, oftentimes they're left with very little security at all. Of course, there's always the possibility of hacking one of these devices, these IoT devices. But in most cases, the attackers don't even have to hack them because many of them have very simple or default passwords built into them. So these IoT devices that, once again, are all over the world, millions of them, if they're compromised, they can be used for DDoS attacks. And we've seen this happen over the years. And we continue to see it. And I think we're on the verge of seeing a massive, a massive DDoS attack that could knock out major countries, uh, major industries. This concerns me, and I think that much of the world is not prepared for this type of attack. Um, I think that if you, you may know that it, when the, the Ukraine-Russia war began, right, in February 2022, well, a number of us, okay, set out to try to DDoS Russia. And a number of us, it might be as much, we don't, we don't know how many there are, but somewhere we think 100,000, okay? Russia thinks it was 17,000. Russia counted all the IP addresses that were involved in the attack, and they came back and said, there was 17,000 IP addresses that were involved in this attack, you know, this massive DDoS attack on Russia. The end result, whatever the number happened to be, you know, if it was if Russia was right at 17,000 or we're more accurate at 100,000, it's still a small, relatively small number compared to the number of IoT devices there are that could be deployed in a DDoS attack. Right. And with our numbers, we were able basically to knock out the, the entire Russian internet, okay? And, you know, the, the, stock, the stock market, um, the major telecom companies were all knocked out. As a matter of fact, the Rostelcom, uh, Rostelecom, I guess is what it's pronounced, which is the, the telecom company in Russia, the major, said that our attack was the largest they'd ever, ever seen. So it was twice the size of anything they'd ever seen. And they were largely unprepared for an attack of our scale. Uh -huh. But the important lesson from that is that even a country that's relatively sophisticated like Russia was not prepared for the scale of attack that we could mount against them. And we were able to keep them largely offline for about six weeks. That's a, that's a long time if you think about it, right? It's a long time to keep a whole country offline. So, or at least major institutions in that country. We clogged up all of the internet and we knocked out many of the major institutions that were allied with the government and the military. Some people were I have, have been a little bit concerned because Russia has vowed that they're going to get us all back, all 17,000 of us, or whatever the number has been. And we've seen the Russians retaliate against some who were involved in this. But it's still, you know, for the most part, most of the people who participated are still up and running. Everybody's still alive, okay? Uh, and a few people have lost computers to attacks, but for the most part, everybody's still functioning. But this really should be a lesson to the world that 
DDoSing a country is really a, a real thing. You can DDoS an entire country. And the Russians have done this many times throughout history. Those people who have read my book read, might have read the early parts where we talk about the history of hacking. And Russia has DDoSed entire countries before, right? And this is something that they do usually before they attack. Um, and we kind of turned the tables on them and said, okay, you know, we're going to DDoS you. And I think we were far more effective than the Russian DDoS attackers were. But this, we didn't use IoT, okay? We did not use IoT, okay? We, we used all 17,000 individuals, okay? Huh. And there were, some, there were some botnets involved, but still they're relatively small ones. So the point I'm really trying to emphasize is that one, it's possible to DDoS a whole country and two, we haven't really seen the millions of IoT devices deployed yet, although we know that both Russia and China have compromised millions of these, okay? I mean, actually, this past week, we got some reports that China has compromised several industrial facilities in the U.S., okay? Um, they've been compromised even more, these IoT devices. And these IoT devices being basically Linux computers can be turned into DOS machines, okay? And that's something that everybody should become concerned about. One of the things that we have seen of late that's, um, that is relatively new is we've begun to see some relatively sophisticated DOS attacks that use UDP instead of TCP, right? So those of you who are studying your TCP IP probably have heard of UDP. UDP is connectionless, right? But it's, it's very lightweight. So unlike TCP, TCP has all the overhead of, you know, checking to see whether or not the packets actually arrived, okay? And they arrive in the right order and, all those things, and if they actually do arrive at all, right? right? Whereas UDP doesn't. UDP just sends out, you know, just sends out packets uh, to an IP address, and it's what usually is used, for instance, for music videos or videos in general or audio files. So these packets, because they're much more lightweight, okay, they're much more lightweight, that you can send them out faster, okay? You can send them much faster. And if you fragment them, you can send them out even faster. So you can get more and more packets into a IP address port, right. okay? Into right. a socket and overwhelm systems much more easily using UDP. As a matter of fact, I think we're seeing somewhere around 60% of all the DOS attacks right now are, are UDP. What I, what I was hoping to do here today is to kind of do a little demonstration about what I'm talking about, but doing it with a tool that a lot of beginner hackers haven't seen before. I think I have it in my Getting Started Becoming a Master Hacker, and it's called HPing3. HPing3 has been around for quite a while, and it's gotten a reputation of what some people refer to it as a packet crafting tool. Right. And they call it that because you can create just about any kind of packet you want with, with HPing. Unlike Nmap's a great tool. I'm not, I'm not knocking Nmap, but I think Nmap's the most essential tools that every hacker network professional needs to be familiar with. HPing has a little more flexibility in that you can put together packets that don't comply with um, the RFCs, and, right. and you can create all kinds of packets of different sizes, right, and fragment them. And right. send them out in massive amounts, and you can choose what protocol you want to use. Right. So let's take a look then at um, HPing three. Okay, and I I totally agree. So so I think what we see lately one definitely the goal of DDoS attacks is to create disruption, right? Motivation behind cyber attacks were either financial motivation. There are different motivation: activism, right? A nation state, organized crimes, uh, angry, uh, angry people, etc., etc., etc. 
and, and <laughs> sometimes sometimes it's ransom too. Yes, and, some, ransom, sometimes, of course, and ransom. Sometimes though, I've I've been DDoSed and been asked to to, <laughs> uh, to pay a ransom, and and right. I laughed at I laughed at them. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what you mentioned one about the IoT that they are deployed billions already, and it's it's important because if you can slave them, as you said, you can build an army of a DDoS attackers that exactly. is distributed around the the world. Uh, which is more, you know, difficult to uh, to identify. Now, what you mentioned about HPing and what I like about HPing, and I want also the 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 viewers the to to uh, to understand is at the end of the day, today the attacks becoming much more sophisticated. They try to camouflage as a legitimate request. They try to see how they can comply to the RFCs on one end. But on the other end. They try to understand the business logic in order to exploit into the the organization, and 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 uh, then there are deviation from the RFC, small deviation that allows them to you know to disrupt, and that tool allows you to to craft such packets. Of course, UDP right. is maybe the most uh, most common. Uh, uh, a protocol uh, now that is uh, used, but there is also, when we spoke about it offline, s- different sophistication. If in the past the DDoS attacks were more network level attacks, layer four mm-hmm. attacks, to there they are moving more into layer seven. And last thing, think there are three types of DDoS attacks. There is the one that is bit per second, that what we hear all the time in the news, the attack was one giga per per second or one tera or 500 gig. And this aims to disrupt the line, the upstream provider line to to take it down and impact the availability, of course. The second attack, and you also mentioned it with UDP that you can, or fragmentation, you can push more packets. This is packet per second. And this is aiming to take network elements like routers, like switches, like it can be also a DNS. And this is bandwidth. So bit bit per second, packet per second, these are bandwidth DDoS attacks. Now the attacks are moving into the layer seven, it's request per seconds to try to exhaust the servers from from replying. It's coming as an SSL, as encrypted, and today we are dealing with HTTP2, so everything is encrypted, right? And it's coming as a randomized uh, data because it's it's making difficulties for the defenders to identify the pattern. Because if you identify the pattern of the attack, you can build a signature to to match and then mitigate it, uh, right? Um, right. So the world is changing here. Nation states are more involved. Uh, so this is very interesting uh, subject. But I, I, I needed to <laughs> to add also for my. Oh, I, I, I'm I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. So yeah, I wanted to I wanted to just kind of talk about this subject in general about why you know people should be aware of it and not to ignore it because I see a lot of cybersecurity engineers who you know who maybe grew up in the era of you know common ddos attacks and and they don't think that these are something they have to concern themselves with in 2023 but i will reassure you you must be concerned about these ddos attacks and and if you haven't been hit you will be hit soon okay so Let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, a, a quick look at a tool that can be used for these DDoS attacks, and that's HPing. So here's HPing three, right? And so most most beginners have seen, of course, Nmap. All right, this is you know Nmap and dash dash help is what it is, right? Yeah, there's a there's an Nmap, and Nmap's a great tool. It's it's a tremendous tool, and you should you should be familiar with it. All right, uh, and it also has a a lot of scripts now that make it more powerful for vulnerability scanning and for actually from exploitation as well. But there's another tool that I wanted to introduce your viewers to, and that's HPing3, and people often refer to it as the packet crafting tool, because well, you can make packets of just about any type, but it's not as intuitive as Nmap is. So I'm going to go HPing3, and here's the help screen on it. HPing3-H, 
Okay. Now you can see here the mode. Okay. Here's the modes that it will work in. Okay. It'll work in TCP, raw IP, ICMP, UDP. There it is. And then dash eight is just scan mode and dash nine is listen. Uh -huh. You can also spoof. Okay. The source address of where the, where the uh, packets are coming from. Um, is you can also you know tell it what interface to use um the ttl and the id um ttl is a time to live right right and you can go ahead and do a random destination or a random source so that means that it'll appear to be coming from a different ip address each time okay it sends out packets making it more difficult for uh, edge security devices to be able to block it because oftentimes the first thing that a DDoS security device will do is it'll identify that it's under attack and then start to block that IP address. That's the logical thing to do, right? You know, just right. If, you are, if you see a bunch of packets coming from someplace, you go ahead and you just block it. And a random source is going to make it a little bit more difficult you can do other things, you know, like setting up the more frag and don't frag. Notice that frag and more frag, those are packets can be fragmented. That's one of the beauties of TCP IP. And for that matter, actually UDP is that they can actually be fragmented and still be reassembled when they arrive at the destination. But by fragmenting the packets, okay, it makes it more difficult for the edge security device to be able to identify it as a DDoS attack, as well as it allows for the sending of packets faster because the packets are going to be smaller. They're not going to be entire packets. They're going to be fragmented packets. Right. And this can, this can really throw off a lot of devices. Okay. So this is our tool. It's, uh, it's great for doing uh, port scanning and, and other such things, right? Let's just do a quick scan, okay? HPing three, all right, and and then we're gonna do a scan. Let's start off by uh, sudo. Mm -hmm. HPing three. I'm not I'm not doing anything anything malicious, right? I'm just scanning, yeah. right? Yeah. Google.com. and it's not gonna resolve it, so I'm gonna have to. Ping it and pick up the IP address. Well, I didn't remember if it had DNS capabilities. Apparently not. Oh, problem is not Google's. The problem is that I'm not, I don't have outside access. So, and let's go IF config. Yeah, I got WLAN zero, I got ETH zero. Maybe I just need to go DH client, ETH zero. All right, upper sudo. Okay. Okay. And get a DHCP assigned IP address. And now let's try pinging Google. Yeah. Okay. Nope. Good. Yeah. Good. Let's let's try our command again. And here we go. Okay. Now what it's doing is it's going to go ahead and scan. And in this case looks like Google is not responding. So we're gonna have to try to, to scan something else here. Google's not gonna give us a response. Let's go open up another machine here. Let's put up Dragon OS. Those of you who haven't seen Dragon OS before, it's, it's a operating system design, especially for software defined radio. It's got a lot of great tools in it. If you haven't seen it before, check it out. Yes. All right, good, okay. So what we can do then is to try scanning it with HPing3. We have uh, the Dragon OS over there as our target machine, and we can just go HPing3, and then the uppercase S, and then the IP address of the other machine, and we'll go ahead and run it. And you can see what comes back. So what it's doing is it's going out and sending out a packet, like in this case, a TCP packet, and it's going out to see the S port, okay? Yep. S source port, okay? Mm -hmm. And then it shows it shows the the RA 
that means reset act. Those are the flags. Remember uh -huh. your flags. You have the six flags in TCP. And when you send a packet out to a port that's closed, it comes back with the reset act. Just like so, it's telling us this port is closed, right? right? A little different than Nmap because Nmap tells you, you know, gives you a nice summary report. This one doesn't really do that, okay? But we can here it just started at uh, port zero. We can tell it we want to go ahead and scan, say, port eighty, right? That would make sense. Right? Right. Try and see if we can see if port eighty is open, and you can see that port eighty is still telling me it's closed. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the reset act. So you can see that one of the things that that HPing three does is it makes it a little more difficult to understand and interpret the results. You have to know a little bit of TCP to be able to interpret the results. Mm -hmm. okay? but the beauty of this tool is that it allows us to create packets of just about any type and size. Right. So we were talking about the UDP packets being used in many of the attacks. And oftentimes what we can do Okay, it, with a tool like you know, HPing3 or other tools as well, is to go out and send out a flood of fragmented UDP packets. All right, so HPing allows us to do that. All right, I'll show you how to do that in just a second. So we can go ahead and go sudo, right? And then we go HPing3. Right. And then the, the uppercase S for, for scan. And then we're going to tell it we want to do it in UDP mode, okay? And then we want to flood, right? Send send the packets as fast as you can, okay? And spoof. Or we could also do random source IP address. Remember that was one of the options. But here, what we do is just going to spoof an IP address. In this case, we'll just create an IP address on our network and tell. So when the packets arrive at the target, they say the source IP address is this one right here, right? Oh. And uh, our IP address is actually 107, we'll call it 101. Okay, that's where we're gonna, the packets are gonna appear to be coming from, and then they're going to, okay, 107, what was it, 52? 136, I think. 136, okay. okay. Okay, so now, now we got two IP addresses that look good. Um, and then what this will do then is it'll send out a flood of UDP packets, okay, spoofing the IP address, okay, using this IP address as the source IP address and this one as the destination IP address. And let's go ahead and run that and see how it does. Okay, so it's going ahead and it's flooding, okay, the other system with a massive amount of fragmented UDP packets. And this can, you know, with a number of, of entities running this simultaneously at the same target, it can and take down a lot of systems. Right. You know, one, one of the things that we've seen in recent years that is a nice thing within network administration is we've got these scanners now that are really, really powerful scanners and things like mass scan and ZMAP. They're very powerful scanners, scanners that are capable of sending out enough packets to scan every IP address in the world in a matter of minutes, right? If you mistakenly run one of those things on your own network, you will, you will, Dash your own network, right? Definitely. And, and, and yeah, you know, they run so fast that they send out so many packets. Well, you know, that is another the tool that can be used for dosing a network with mass scan and or ZMAP. Okay, so these tools, you know, we're just beginning to see them being used in DOS attacks. And I think that's something, because they can generate packets so fast, right, that that's something that uh, we need to be concerned about. So HPing3 is, you know, is a, is a tool that can do and create a packet that is necessary to, to be able to send these fragmented packets, spoofed fragmented packets, mm -hmm. to a target. But we also have a number of other tools that are out there that with a little bit of tweaking, 
okay? Because both MassScan and ZMAP are sending out TCP packets, okay, by default. With some tweaking, we can get them to send out TCP, UDP packets, and create massive amounts of traffic on the network. Right, right. You know, I, I looked um, today in the telegram of some of the activist groups, uh, pro-Russians one, like um, Anonymous Sudan. Kilnet, not Sudan. Or yes. Kilnet, or Kilnet, or Anonymous Sudan. Anonymous Sudan, they are offering like a service as well, join a service called Skynet. And of course, we are not recommending it uh, here. <laughs> Without permission is illegal, uh, etc. Right. But why I'm emphasizing that, because you mentioned a few tools, and this tool, you're offering $100 per day, um, and you can generate significant amount of traffic that can take any organization down in $100 right. a day. For $100 a day. A day. Yeah. It's... And there are, and I saw in the dark web also, you know, professional even uh, DDoS sites that are offering uh, from a... Uh, um, $13, $13.99, or even a price of a, a coffee in Starbucks, right? <laughs> Tax of a 15 gigabit per second for 30 days. And if you want to take down an enterprise with 200 gig, it will cost you less than $2,000 a month without right. a stop. It's, it's, it's so cheap. So definitely, it's very easy to use. You don't even need it, to exploit anything. You can use like a DDoS as a service. Right. Exactly. And we're seeing we're seeing a lot of the DDoS as a service as well as for years we've been seeing ransomware as a service and ransomware as a service has grown dramatically. So right. and it's much easier to do a DDoS attack than it is to do ransomware. Right. So so DDoS attacks, you know, we really haven't seen the peak, I don't think, in DDoS attacks. And I think we're gonna continue to see growth in DDoS attacks. Yeah. And if we get into additional uh, nation-state um, conflicts, we're right. going to see more and more of these directed at entire nations. And they have the capability of knocking a, an entire nation offline for some period of time, not, not indefinitely, but certainly for some, some period of time. You mentioned the ransomware as a DDoS, and, and I agree, we start to see this phenomena also by extorters, and, and because as you said, it's easy, it's easier than a regular ransomware that you need to penetrate the organization and then encrypt the files, right? Keep the key and threaten them, but you need to penetrate the organization. In DDoS, right. you don't. You don't need it. Exactly. So exactly. what we see, organizations are getting a ransom letters. We are, for example, the Lazarus Group or Cozybe or, or others. And you can Google about us to see that we are a serious hacking group. And now we are going to attack your, this is the IP, we are going to attack it uh, in mm -hmm. the coming 24 hours. We'll, we'll start modestly with a small attack just to show you that we are capable. And then if you will not pay the ransom of X uh, Bitcoins, we'll start to bombard you on a daily basis at this level of uh, uh, scale. And every day that you do not pay, the ransomware will double. So this became yeah. a very easy uh, uh, and common way uh, of uh, DDoS attacks, as well for financial motivation, by the way. Yeah, there's definitely financial motivation. And I think that some of the groups that I have seen uh, aren't real capable. I mean, some of them, it's just a bluff. It's a threat. And there's really don't have the capability. They can maybe... They can send a bunch of packets at you to temporarily slow your system down or you know temporarily knock you offline so you know before you go pay in a ransom you know just kind of make you know try to evaluate whether or not these people these people are real because some of them are not real but the truth of the matter is is that these ddos attacks are relatively simple to complete and so you can have you know a lot of marginally talented hackers participate in DDoS attack. They don't have to be sophisticated. They don't have to be sophisticated to be able to take your entire company offline. We do see a surge of uh, uh, DDoS attacks, mainly influenced by the geopolitical tension we are in 
Russia and Ukraine, Israel, uh, Hamas, uh, the conflict between China and Taiwan and the Western world against different alliances also in the in uh, Asia uh, uh, Pacific. We, the, the, the way and the sophistication and uh, the, the growth, at least the frequency, is also triggered by one ease of use and and cheap services that can uh, uh, that can be used uh, today, um, definitely. And one example is this uh, HPing uh, tool that can allow us to to craft and manipulate um, packets to to cause uh, arm, uh, definitely. So the the risk is here, and as you said, it's not a if you will be attacked; it's only when. And I think everyone should be aware. I think maybe we can keep more even following uh, um, videos about this, maybe even more thoroughly uh, to save it for uh, next time. That sounds good to me. Okay, great. So with that said, again, Occupy the Web, thanks so much for uh, joining, sharing your uh, view, experience, uh, thoughts. And thank you all for uh, watching this video. And definitely we will continue to do uh, more and more and see you in the next one.